the Fed was setting interest rates by adjusting the size of the amount of reserves in the system to, to achieve the federal funds target rate. With all of this liquidity in the financial system and rates near zero, how would the Fed ensure that rates didn't fall below zero? You are listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to C-Suite Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. C-Suite Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of subjects that matter to most business leaders. I'm Dana Peterson, Chief Economist at the Conference Board and the guest host of today's episode. In today's conversation, we'll discuss the evolution of the Fed's monetary policy framework and its impact on the financial landscape. Joining me is Kurt Ryman, Senior Economist, Finance, Risk, and Strategy. Welcome, Kurt. Thanks very much, Dan. It's good to be with you. Excellent. So let's just dive right in. How did the 2007-09 global financial crisis reshape the Federal Reserve's approach to monetary policy, particularly in terms of its balance sheet size and composition? So let's you know go back time travel to 2007 and reflect on that this was a period of great difficulty in the economy. Deflation was a bigger risk than inflation. If you can imagine that today with, with the inflation that we've been dealing with over the past couple of years. And rising unemployment offered the prospects of actually becoming entrenched among mostly the younger and less well-educated workers. And here's the Fed with a dual uh, mandate of full employment and price stability. So it had to first use its its tools that it had available to itself, which uh, we call conventional tools. Uh, and that was to reduce interest rates to near zero. So when you think about the, the global financial crisis and, and consumers were saddled with debt and businesses uh, were also suffering greatly, reducing interest rates, reducing the cost of credit to encourage borrowing when you know we were sort of starting on this phase of a of a decades long deleveraging, really wasn't going to do uh, what was necessary. And fiscal policy, right, the other tool that can address a downturn as deep as what we saw in the financial crisis, was delayed. And you could even maybe argue that it was insufficient to plug the gap. You remember the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. That was about $800 billion. It came only in February of 2009. So the financial crisis was, you know, was really well underway at this point. So this is where the Fed comes in. And it, it deployed a number of different tools. I, I won't go into all of them, but I, you know, I think of it as, as in a way, the Fed you know, had, its, had its policy rate, that it, the Fed funds target rate that it could move lower, it did. But that's like using a Band-Aid to stop the hemorrhaging of, of an amputation. It needed something else, and, and it used its balance sheet and other tools. By saying that it used its balance sheet, effectively what it did was it bought assets. It bought treasury bonds and mortgage securities to the tune of over $9 trillion. But this was a sea change. The Fed operated uh, with a balance sheet that was quite small in a limited reserves framework. It had something on the average of $17 billion in reserves that banks parked with the Fed for regulatory reasons and also to have cash on hand for its customers. That $17 billion grew to roughly $2.5 trillion by 2014, and then it grew to $4 trillion in 2022. And that marked the change from what was a limited reserves framework to one that was an ample reserves framework. That ample reserves actually became abundant reserves. So we have had an economy that over the course of the past 15 years has had sufficient, ample, abundant, um, however you want to describe it, liquidity because of, at first, the global financial crisis uh, and then the pandemic. That's an excellent backgrounder, Kurt. So can you explain the role of quantitative easing in the Fed's response to the global financial crisis? And how did this uh, QE, as we call it, influence longer term interest rates and investor behavior? Right. So that's really what the Fed was after, was if it couldn't reduce short term interest rates any further, and that 
wasn't going to induce consumers, households, businesses to take out credit to jumpstart the economy, then by purchasing assets, the Fed had this tool to provide liquidity to the financial system and bring intermediate and longer term interest rates lower. That, that was the effect of these purchases. There was an announcement effect at first when financial markets weren't expecting it. So when this was announced, it brought interest rates out the yield curve. So longer maturity instruments, those yields fell. And then just the purchases themselves, that liquidity injection into the financial system helped to then stabilize financial markets. You might all remember, if you're students of, of the financial markets, the low in the stock market was around March of 2009. The Fed had started buying assets, and this, this did have an important stabilizing effect. As the Fed was buying uh, assets, treasury bonds, mortgage-backed securities, it had to have an offsetting liability, and that took the form of mostly bank reserves. Now, there was some question about whether this rise in bank reserves could have led to a sharp uptick in the money supply and eventually inflation. But remember, there was already a tightening of lending standards and an inability on the part of households and businesses to take out new loans. So for the most part, this increase in assets stayed as reserves on bank balance sheets, and it didn't lead to the inflation that some had been concerned about uh, at the time. So what were some of the main challenges and risks associated with the Fed's decision to adopt unconventional monetary policy measures, such as QE during the financial crisis, and then also once again, you know, during the pandemic? Exactly. The biggest risk at the time from the Fed's perspective was not doing enough. There were worries about the economy dropping into deflation. And, and as you know, in a deflationary environment, the debts that you hold become even larger and people hold off on consumption because they think that goods and services will become cheaper by the day. So I think at the time, the global financial crisis, again, the pandemic, the Fed's approach was we need to do as much as possible to arrest the concerns about deflation. There were those, as I mentioned before, that were worried about the inflationary consequences of a large balance sheet, but this didn't, this didn't become an issue. Now, the other, I guess the other concern was that the Fed became one of the largest owners of treasuries and agency-backed mortgage securities. If you think about the the purchases and you know as a, as it as it relates to the total stock of this debt outstanding, in 2014 the Fed owned one out of every five dollars of Treasury and agency mortgage-backed securities debt outstanding. In 2022, at the apex of this balance sheet expansion, the Fed owned one out of every four, so 25 percent. That's a pretty impressive feat when you consider the fact that the Treasury was also going through a period of a large increase in the amount of debt outstanding. I guess the other I, thing that we should be thinking about with respect to the concerns would be operationally. How, how would, if the Fed was setting interest rates by adjusting the size of the amount of reserves in the system to, to achieve the federal fund's target rate, then operationally, how is the Fed going to achieve a policy rate with bank reserves that now amounted into the trillions of dollars? With all of this liquidity in the financial system and rates near zero, how would the Fed ensure that rates didn't fall below zero? You know, guiding the Fed funds rate in that low rate environment was a difficult operational question. Again, how to guide the Fed funds rate when rates started rising was when they had to start increasing interest rates was another consideration. Uh, I think, secondly, the, um, the balance sheet assets, without disrupting financial markets, when they ended up deciding to reduce them, you might remember back to the taper tantrum in 2013, that was something that I think the Fed learned a lot from and when it came time to, to finally implement quantitative tightening in 2014, uh, they learned a lot from that initial lesson. And then lastly, I'd say, you know, deciding when reserves 
have gotten down to a level that are not abundant, but are actually ample the way the Fed wants them to be, that's a tricky exercise. That is not something that you know. It's not science. It's something that I think for the Fed is going to be more art. It's going to be something where they're going to have to gauge conditions in financial markets. And the last time that reserves they thought were ample, they ended up being scarce. Uh, and we can, you know, we can talk about that. But those those are some of the considerations that I think the Fed had in mind when when it embarked on this this new approach. Thanks, Garrett. You mentioned uh, the Fed's federal funds target range. So it's not one rate. It's basically this corridor that they that they have. But they also use two other interest rates to manage this corridor to make sure that the, the effective federal funds rate does not go too high or too low. What are those two administered rates and how do they function in the current monetary policy regime? Yes, there are two. We could even maybe argue there's Three, but let's start with interest on reserve balances. That means the Fed pays banks interest on the reserves that the banks hold with the Fed. That has not always been the case. It was in October 2008, just at the time when the Fed was working to move from this limited reserves framework to this ample reserves framework, where they had to think about, well, how do we encourage banks to hold those reserves at the Fed, uh, even at those paltry low levels of interest, that was an inducement for the banks to hold those reserves with the Fed. And that interest on reserve balances is in a way one of the floors that the Fed uses. But banks are not the only intermediary or the the only institutions that bank with the Fed funds rate. There's also money market funds and other non-bank financial institutions that the Fed had to concern itself with. And this didn't this this rate didn't become relevant until uh, 2013 when the Fed had to start thinking about raising interest rates from this you know epically low zero lower bound. And it was at that time when they introduced what's called the overnight reverse repurchase rate. I think one of the simplest ways to think about this is the Fed is trying to take some of this extra cash, out of the financial system in exchange for securities that these money market funds hold overnight, and they earn an interest rate on this. It's not technically an interest rate, but it's the difference between the price that they lend to the Fed and and the price they receive when they get them back. If we didn't have these tools to pull some of that cash out of the system, we would have rates falling below the floor. The ceiling is the discount rate. So the Fed went from a Fed funds target rate to this Fed funds target range. It used to be that it would adjust the supply of reserves to create the Fed funds target rate that it wanted to achieve. And now it uses these administered rates, ones that that they set and declare to the market and pay interest to banks and non-banks to effectively take cash out of the financial system or to shore up some of that liquidity. And, and that's how they've been operating since 2008 and then, again, 2013 with respect to uh, the overnight reverse repurchase rate. So what factors led to the decision to pay interest on reserves? At first, it was interest on excess reserves, and they moved to interest on reserves. Yep. And how has this policy affected the behavior of banks and non-bank financial institutions? I think another way to look at this also is that, you know, from the perspective of banks, they would think about reserves as a tax. Banks didn't want to hold reserves. They would rather generate earnings off of the deposits that were stored at the bank. But because of regulatory requirements and the needs of their customers, they parked money with the Fed and they didn't earn any res- any interest. But today, there's almost this question of whether banks storing their this cash with the Fed earns banks a certain a convenience yield, meaning that the level of the, the reserves in the system and what banks are earning from the Fed might be in excess of what is really necessary. And, and that, that gets into what the Fed is doing now, which is trying to reduce the size of its balance sheet by letting these securities roll off. It's called quantitative tightening or QT for short. That is, in effect, trying to reverse some of the policies of financial crisis and the pandemic trying to wean the Fed off of its 
purchases of assets and the big role, outsized role that it now plays, and also helping the Fed to achieve some of its mandate through reduced liquidity, potentially not being as much of a, a maybe an upward pressure on, on inflation. This is a really great conversation. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with more of my conversation with Kurt Ryman. What does the future of work mean for your employees? How will your company navigate ESG? Will there be a global recession? At the conference board, our experts translate the latest research and economic analysis into insights and real-time problem solving for your organization. Membership at the conference board provides your team with an assortment of knowledge from economics, marketing and communications, ESG, public policy, and human capital. As a member, you'll have access to our center experts, member exclusive events, data and benchmarking tools, and peer sharing that will help you understand the present and shape the future. Consider becoming a conference board member today by visiting www.conference-board.org. Welcome back to C-Suite Perspectives. I'm your host, Dana Peterson, Chief Economist at the Conference Board. Again, I'm joined by Kurt Ryman, Senior Economist of Finance, Risk, and Strategy. So Kurt, let's jump back right back in there. What are some of the key differences between the Fed's reserve liabilities and non-reserve liabilities? And how do these non-reserve liabilities contribute to the functioning of the financial system? Okay, well, let's break it down again, just to remind everybody, the Fed's assets, so the asset side of the balance sheet, that's treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities. The liability side of the balance sheet matches, but it's made up of bank reserves and what we call non-reserve liabilities. Hopefully by now everybody understands bank reserves, that's cash held at the Fed. But these non, non-reserve liabilities are in pretty much three parts. The first is currency and circulation. That shouldn't be too unfamiliar to most of us because that's paper notes and coins held in the public uh, that we use to facilitate transactions. And it's also going to include what banks uh, have held at at the Fed. This is one of the, the Fed's original liabilities. Think of it as a liability for the Fed, but it's an asset to all of us. Then there's the Treasury General account. This is an asset of the Treasury. It's a liability for the Fed. It's effectively the Treasury's checking account, and it's held at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It's here to manage the Treasury's cash flows, and it is not in the Fed's control. The Fed acts as the fiscal agent for the Treasury. It writes checks. It takes income. But this is not something that the Fed can can really control. And then there's what we talked about earlier, which is this overnight reverse repurchase program, part of that floor system for ensuring that the Fed funds rate falls within that corridor. And again, I think of this as the cash that the Fed receives from any number of counterparties. It's a bank, it's a money market fund. In exchange for securities, which are then sold back to the Fed the next day, those four primary silos, bank reserves, currency and circulation, the Treasury General account, which some of us refer to as the TGA, and the overnight reverse repo or repurchase program, that makes up the bulk of the Fed's liabilities. So how has the growth of currency and circulation impacted the Fed's balance sheet and monetary policy considerations, especially during periods of economic uncertainty, such as the pandemic? This is interesting because I think of currency and circulation as something that's going towards extinction. And yet the reverse is true. If you didn't look at the numbers, you'd probably think what I think, which is we're all going to electronic transactions and credit cards. But the reality is that the pandemic changed the way that households and companies think about currency and circulation. So it had a big jump. One of the largest jumps in in the growth of currency and circulation happened during the pandemic, the largest since uh, in the post-war period. And the reason for this is that companies and households got caught short cash. Companies needed working capital. So coming out of the pandemic, ironically, what, we're, what we found is that currency growth and the need for, for cash is something that is prioritized. Now, that may change, but for right now, you know, this is something that 
has changed during the pandemic. And, it, and I, I do believe it's durable because of this jump in uncertainty. I think the pandemic fiscal stimulus also contributed to it. Ca- households had more cash. So, so they- That cash is run out, by the way. So. That's, that's, that's right. <laughs> wow, we're not seeing this as a big driver right now yeah. of, of, of the balance sheet. Right, because that's what I was going to ask you. Um, there was a massive fiscal stimulus that put cash in the pockets of not only consumers, but also businesses through the PPP. And that's all been worked through now. So maybe we're going back to the world where you know, cash is not always king. What are your thoughts about that? I think to some extent that the secular decline and the need for cash is the dominant theme for households. For companies, I do think that this having a, a rainy day fund or a war chest or an iron reserve is something that they will prioritize because anyway, they they weren't shifting daily transactions from credit cards to cash. They just want to have more working capital. So I think there's two trends. One in favor of this maybe secular decline in currency and circulation, the other working in the other direction. Well, I think it's also important for the Treasury. So the Treasury General Account is the wallet for the U.S. Treasury, and um, they need that wallet to be pretty fat, especially when we have these debt ceiling events. So, I mean, how has this Treasury General Account balance fluctuated over the years and what impact does this have on monetary policy? Because you know we like to think that the Treasury and the Fed work separately, but the Treasury does have its piggy bank right. sitting at the Fed. So tell us about that. That's right. And you know, before 2008, the, the Treasury sought to stabilize the TGA uh, so that it wouldn't interfere with the conduct of monetary policy. That's that I think that's a really interesting observation to me, because the Fed was managing its bank reserves. And if the Treasury general account fluctuated a lot, that that might have had undue consequences for the setting of of monetary policy. After the decision to pay interest on reserves, the Treasury no longer needed to stabilize the TGA, and they allowed it to fluctuate in line with the government's funding needs. What we really should be focused on is the debt limit and the fact that the Treasury general account at each one of these call it standoffs, declines to near zero. And when the Treasury general account falls to zero, but liabilities can't really fall alongside it, unless, of course, the Fed is engaged in quantitative tightening, then reserves have to come back up in order to accommodate that decline in the TGA. It also, you know, I I think this is also something that the Fed, we have to acknowledge, the Fed cannot control this. It's something that is outside their remit. The Treasury decides what it thinks is a steady state size of the of the Treasury general account right now. That's around $750 billion. The Treasury has more than replenished that account. But the issue is, is that we're coming up to a, another showdown in January. So I think we have to be mindful of this. And then there's, 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 to me, an interesting case study back to 2019. This was, some of you might remember, the Fed had, had stopped the balance sheet roll-off. It had ended quantitative tightening. But very shortly thereafter, and it thought it had reached a level of, of reserves that it was ample uh, from abundant. And what happened was that in the span of about two weeks, $120 billion worth of reserves came out of the system. There was a corporate tax payment to the Treasury, and there was a large Treasury auction. And that cash need caused severe indigestion in short-term funding markets. This may be something of a, an anecdote to, to, to look at. It may be something that we need to be concerned about even now with the Fed's quantitative tightening. However, what happened was this obscure short-term interest rate, then known as the Secured Overnight Funding Rate, or SOFR for short, uh, which, by the way, is now the replacement for LIBOR, uh, wasn't very, was pretty thinly traded back then, is very, very widely traded now. Uh, that, that rate jumped 300 basis points overnight because of a shortage of cash in the system. There have been some facilities put in place to try to mitigate that same event from happening this time 
but it just goes to show what was one of the precursors to this sharp rise in the secured overnight funding rate? It was a treasury auction. So fiscal policy and monetary policy, you know, they do sometimes uh, dovetail with unintended consequences, and we, we need to be mindful of that. So what is the overnight reverse re- repurchase program, which you mentioned earlier, the rate that goes along with it? What is the program itself, and how does it act as a floor for the effective federal funds rate? Well, you know, the, the use of the overnight reverse repurchase was, was pretty limited in the first few years, and that was, you know, in 2013 and 2014. We saw that facility rise to two trillion. So out of the out of the roughly nine trillion in the in, in liabilities, the overnight reverse repurchase program was two trillion of that. That maxed out around 2022 and 2023. And wouldn't you know it, this was right around those debt ceiling showdowns. So the question is, why would that why would the overnight reverse repurchase facility grow in use? around debt ceiling showdowns. And the answer is that if you're a money market fund and you're choosing whether to buy treasury bills, which is typically what they buy, that could face a missed payment if the Congress doesn't raise the debt limit in time, or Fed funds, you know, which is the Fed being the lender of last resort, it's gonna make it's gonna make its payment. Well money market funds are going to clearly at those times prefer the added security of taking their cash and and lending it to the Fed, as opposed to lending it to treasuries, which may experience a technical default. So what we've seen recently is that this facility has been run down. It's almost at zero. It should probably fall pretty close to zero by the end of this year, because again, the Treasury General account's been replenished. Uh, the debt limit is still a few, you know, several months off. But once we get back to that period of the Treasury general account falling and maybe another point where the Treasury is running out of cash, well, I think we can expect this facility to grow in size. Again, that the money market fund community will, will switch back a- away from buying Treasuries uh, bills in particular to, to the Fed. The interesting piece about all of this is that if currency and circulation is not falling, Treasury general accounts being replenished at a slow, you know, both of these have, have, have risen, those two will be putting downward pressure on reserves, all else equal, but all else is not equal, <laughs> right? So the, the overnight reverse repurchase program has fallen sharply. And because of that, in this whole period of balance sheet reduction and assets, uh, falling off the balance sheet through quantitative tightening, reserves, bank reserves, haven't actually haven't fallen at all. And that's very different from the last time the Fed engaged in quantitative tightening when reserves did fall pretty steadily and got to a point where they were scarce. We haven't seen any any hiccups really in financial markets. This is operated in the background the, the, just like the Fed wants it to. Um, it's been very quiet, but reserves have not done any of the heavy lifting of reducing the liability side of the balance sheet. Once that starts to happen, then I think the Fed will admittedly start to become more cautious. They've already announced that they're going to do so. That's why they're slowing the pace of balance sheet reduction quite significantly. They really don't want this to be in the headlines and a front and center news item. Well, let's do a lightning round. So you mentioned that the Fed is carrying out quantitative tightening in a very careful manner, but it is more art than science. So what do you think are some of the risks and challenges associated with the Fed's, you know, winding down of its balance sheet? Well, I think the the first that comes to mind is these interruptions in short-term funding markets, which, again, the Fed has introduced this standing repo facility to provide cash uh, there are a number of banks that have signed up. Not many, but you know, three dozen or so have signed up. It's untested. We don't really know whether or not it will work, but there's no reason necessarily to assume that it won't. But that that lesson from September of 2019, when when secured overnight funding rate jumped 300 basis points, is a cautionary 
exercise and tail that I think central banks and the Fed in particular is, is, is keenly aware of and working to guard against. One other is what is that nirvana ample reserve level when we a year ago lived through a banking crisis and at a time when I would argue that banks are still in a way somewhat cautious. We've also been living through and have been writing about here at the conference board these loans that banks have made to commercial real estate. So it it's likely that banks prefer to hold more reserves and earn interest on those reserves like they are now and to have in a way that flexibility, that liquidity has become an advantage. So reducing the level of reserves too much, I think, is something that is potentially a challenge that's associated with reducing the balance sheet. I would even say there's one other area that I, you know, I don't want to really get too deep in the weeds on it, but the Fed is operating at a loss. When you buy securities and rates, especially bonds, long duration bonds, and rates rise, what happens is they lose value. But then when you buy assets at near zero, but you have liabilities now that have risen with the level of Fed funds, there's a gap between the interest you're receiving on the assets that you hold and the interest that you're paying on the liabilities. So that that used to be a profit. The Fed is not supposed to operate at a profit. It's not a for-profit <laughs> enterprise. It's meant to achieve its dual mandate. But one of the consequences of achieving its dual mandate through expanding its balance sheet, but now raising interest rates, is that it is operating at a loss. And that means that the deficits, all else equal, are larger. That's because the revenues that the Treasury is taking in are reduced. And that this doesn't get a lot of airtime. I'm not sure you know, how much discussion it deserves, but I, I do think that the longer these losses go on, the more attention it may start to receive. Wow, Kurt, that that was really that was a really great conversation, and I'm sure our listeners have learned a lot today. So thank you so much, Kurt, for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You have been listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. 